Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots, and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices. Real experiences. Raw conversation. One destination for it all. E360 TV. Good morning. Good morning to you. Welcome to today's installment of Bathrobe Moments. I'm your host, Lauren Michaels Harris. And today it's the second day of March, y'all. The second day of March, we are inside of Q3. And I'm going to mention it every day that I remember uh, to remind all of us, not just you, but myself as well, uh, to stay focused, set intentions in order to hit those goals that we have for uh, this first quarter. We have uh, 26 more days in this month. How many days? 28 more days in this month. And then, um, you know, then we're going to be into the second quarter. And, you know, this is the springboard for the rest of the year. It really is setting those intentions and and creating momentum as early as possible. We want to get there, right? We're not in competition with each other as much as we are in competition with that thing known as time. We want to get it done. Can I get an amen? Yes. So listen. You know, when I get up in the mornings after I do my little meditation thing, you know, I started that about three weeks ago before I head off to the health club. I take a peek uh, at the headline, you know, headlines in the news, what happened last night or yesterday. or, And I found something this morning that I was like, really? And I want to share it with you and get your thoughts on it. You know, uh, I'm 58 years old. I grew up, many of us did, reading and learning how to read through the Dr. Seuss books. Remember those? The Cat in the Hat and all of those uh, green eggs and ham, right? And uh, I saw something this morning uh, where they are... There's uh, different school systems and things across the country that are, um, well, they're deciding to not uh, promote the Dr. Seuss books. They say, um, 
Now, what is that? Wait a minute. Hold on a second, y'all. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, I'm trying to pull it up. Hold on. But it's showing some hair commercial. Like, I need that. Okay. Is that it? Okay, there it is. Is that it? Yeah, okay. Let me get in here and pull this up so you can see it. It just started playing on its own. Scary. Um, so, anyway, let's take a look at what they're saying about it. Just out this morning. Brand new. And I wanted to get your thoughts on it since I know we all know these books so well. Read across America Day, Dr. Seuss characters pop up all over the country to help promote reading in schools. But this year, there's a twist worthy of an Agatha Christie novel. Several Scandal. national articles claim Northern Virginia's Loudoun County Public Schools canceled Dr. Seuss for this year's Read Across America Day over racist undertones in his books. So did Loudoun County Schools ban Dr. Seuss books? Our sources are Loudoun County Public Schools and a 2019 study from the University of California, San Diego. Loudoun County Schools sent us a statement that said in part, quote, Dr. Seuss books have not been banned and are available to students in our libraries and classrooms. However, Dr. Seuss and his books are no longer the emphasis of Read Across America Day. So no, Dr. Seuss hasn't been banned in Loudoun County Schools, but the district has moved away from associating him with the reading celebration. Why? Well, this goes back to a 2019 Here comes. of diversity and racism in Dr. Seuss books published by the University of California, San Diego. In this study, researchers found, quote, of the 2,240 identified human characters, there are 45 characters of color representing 2% of the total number of human characters. Come on, really? Quote. The study also said those characters of color showcase either stereotypes or racist undertones, which led Loudoun County Public Schools to write, quote, given this research and LCPS's focus on equity and culturally responsive instruction, LCPS provided this guidance to schools during the past couple of years to not connect Read Across America Day exclusively with Dr. Seuss's birthday. So no, Loudoun County Schools didn't ban Dr. Seuss, but they have emphasized not associating the reading celebration with the author. Okay, so there it is. We want to get the truth out there as soon as possible, lead with the truth and not start a bunch of rumors. We love Dr. Seuss. Now, so there it is. They're just not going to tie it completely to, uh, you know, the Read Across America Day, but they're not banning the books. And, you know, this is kind of like, do you remember this past Christmas, I heard, you know, that song, baby, it's cold outside that there, there were, um, stations that wouldn't play it because they said that it was, um, what do you call it? Like against women, you know, um, you know, trying to force uh, no means no is what it was, but no, I want to go home. No, it's cold out there. You get it. And I kind of could understand that. And there was, I think it was John Lennon and somebody who oh, John Lennon, John legend. Yeah. Oh, John Lennon. If it was, it was John Legend and some female singer that uh, wanted to get the rights to rewrite some of the, the lyrics within Baby It's Cold Outside because of how it spoke to the right. What do you guys think about all that stuff? You know, there are things, there were different mindsets back in the day and uh, decades ago that do uh, have undertones. Tell me, uh, do you think we're being too, 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 um, you know, what do you think? What do you think? Should we change history um, or should we let it out there and teach through it? I don't know. You tell me. That's the bell of purpose. It is rang every time there's something out on the table that I think you ought to take a closer look at. So I'm asking you when you hear it during the show, be a part of something bigger than yourself. Share the broadcast out. Invite somebody to get in here and get some of this good gooey, chewy, gooey center that we want you to have. This isn't always roadkill out in the middle. Sometimes when you back up and peek your head out the window and take a good look, you see that, ooh, there's value in that. I'm going to take it with me. That's the Bella Purpose. Help me welcome to the show as always. This is my Ed McMahon. This is Lucy McGillicuddy Ricardo. And she is here to help me out today. Today's guest is, is no stranger to bathrobe moments. He's been here several times. Good friend of mine. And uh, what a story. He's, uh, I call him the shock jock uh, because he's doing his thing out there and he doesn't apologize for anything. You're going to find out more about that today, how he got to where he's at. Well, he just went through something over the past couple of months. I'm hoping he will share today to give you some insight and some encouragement about how it's not what it looks like on the outside. It's always about how we deal with it from the inside. So put your hearts together, put some hearts on the screen, and let's welcome our guest today in bathrobe fashion. Here he comes, Sonny Von Cleveland. Go 
Good morning, my friend. Good morning. How are you? Good. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me back. Oh, thanks for being here. We're happy to have you. Uh, so how, how you been? Tell everybody where you're at and uh, who you are. Uh, I am Sonny Von Cleveland. Uh, I am a show host, a YouTube content creator and motivational speaker. Uh, and I'm currently in my studio, in my home. Where is that? Cleveland, Ohio. Oh. Oh, okay. So you live in the town that has your name. Indeed. Well, I live just outside of it. I'm kind of like in the suburban area, but uh huh. Okay. Now you you how's Roman doing? Little mini me. Uh, he's doing very well. He just had his third birthday on Friday. Uh he's growing like a weed. He looks like he's six. Right. He's built like he's six. He is. When he yeah. goes to kindergarten, he's going to be hanging out with third graders. Oh, man, they grow fast. Oh, they he, do. He grows so fast. So give, give everybody a little insight about your your backstory. You know, it's uh, uh, a thing we do when we, we look at what you have or what a person has or what they're doing. And we just assume that it was easy for them or, um, you know, uh, they're the lucky one, so to speak, or something like that. Or we just wonder, how do I how do I get to where this person is? So why don't you tell everybody about how you grew up, uh, where you came from, and some of the things that you've had to deal with that have played a huge part in the story uh, you share with the world today. Well, uh, I grew up in a small town in Michigan, uh, in trailer parks, and uh, it was a pretty rough childhood. I uh, grew up with, you know, uh, uh, some molestation in my life from the age of five until I was 10, mm. uh, being molested by uh, four men. Uh, I started catching felonies at a young age because the attention from the police uh, became kind of like a disciplinarian father figure that I enjoyed from men that didn't want to hurt me, uh, which ultimately led to me having a slew of felonies by the time I was a teenager. Uh, when I was 15, they got sick of it. They bound me over to adult court, sent me to prison uh, for five years, where I became even worse. As at, at age 15, they sent you to prison? Yeah. Uh, they, well, they sent me at 15. I actually went to prison when I turned 16, right after I turned 16. Uh, and then I got out when I was 21 uh, in way worse condition than I was when I went in. Do you think? I survived for about 20 months in the free world, 22 months. Uh, and then I went back for 12 more years. And uh, during that time, I got a really good change in life uh, on the back of a 19-month stint in the hole with a, a, a wonderful Muslim brother named Mallory Bay, who helped change my life mm -hmm. and uh, gave me a purpose and helped me define my purpose and my passion in life, uh, which was to inspire and help other people to avoid uh, going through a lot of the things that I went through, through self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I was released and I started to put those tools into play. And uh, here we sit uh, four years later, uh, just grinding hard work and, and dedication, man. And, and there's been ups and downs. There's been bumps all over that road. Uh, but oh, we're there always is. Yeah. We still fight. We don't give up. We never quit. We believe in ourselves and we march forward, man. And that is the true path to victory in whatever you take. So what was your first felony for, if I can ask? Uh, I was breaking and entering with intent to commit larceny over a hundred dollars. So were you just hanging out with the wrong crowd? Were you a solo criminal? What, how, what, and why were you doing it? Was it because a lot of kids, um, uh, you know, they don't, people just assume that they, they, they commit crimes because of lack of anything else to do. But some kids I've met some who, who do these things because there's no parental guidance. There's no food in the house. They don't have any money to do anything. Um, what was it that, uh, what were you trying to accomplish by doing that? Was it just the well, atten attention or was there well, something else? At the time, at the time, I, I obviously wasn't able to comprehend what was going on psychologically in my mind. Um, so it, it, it wasn't, I mean, I had my mother and my brother, she was a single mom. Uh, she had boyfriends that would come and go, uh, you know, trying different relationships, but it seems like they always moved in really quickly. And, um, I don't know. I, I, I was, a, I was pretty much a loner. I would always spend a lot of time, you know, whenever my mother was entertaining guests or whatever, I would always hide off in the closet with her music, her, her little tape box full of, of music. 
Um, and then during the day times when I was alone, I would be out in the woods uh, playing in the creeks and, and I grew up in the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we, when we committed that first crime, it was literally, it was just two brothers that were, you know, young kids. I was seven, he was eight or nine. And we were, it just looked like a good idea at the time. Like, Hey man, they got, to, we, we would, I remember walking around, it was a St. Mary's cathedral. And I remember walking around looking through the basement windows. And then in one of the basement windows, we saw they had like a rack that had like a bunch of pudding and snacks and stuff on that. And, and I don't recall having a lot of that in my life as a, as a seven-year-old. I don't really remember whether or not we had it, but we wanted it. And it was like, well, let's, how do we get in there? So we broke the window and went in through the basement window and grabbed a bunch of the stuff up and went out. I mean, we were across the street eating the stuff and, and playing cards. Uh, when the cops rolled up and were like, where did you get that? <laughs> like, and you're just didn't... little boys. Yeah, and we didn't even lie about it. We were so, like, from there. Why in the world, I know what you guys out there are thinking, because I'm thinking it too. Isn't this where they call a parent and say, you know, because I remember I was eight when Ralph Murphy, a sixth grader, threatened me, and he was he looked bigger, he was bigger than the teachers, uh, told me to go into the Kroger grocery store and steal him a six pack of um, Snickers bars. And I did it because I didn't want to get beat up. And the meat department guy saw me through the window, you know, those doors with the windows down. Yeah. And um, of course, 10 minutes later, I'm up in the manager's booth. That was back in the day when they put, they would sit up there and look out over the, now they got cameras, you know, but back then there was that manager's booth. Remember those? Yes. And you had to wait there until your mom came and you probably won't do it anymore. And then you go home and you right. get a spanking and you get punishment and blah, blah, blah. Right. But why do you think you guys didn't get off on that very first time? What was that all about? Well, my mother, uh, and I want to give a special shout out to Dakota Jacko, who's watching. Uh, we actually grew up together. He was a few years younger than I was, and he's watching now. Um, his father was a great friend of my mother and who became a great friend of mine. And uh, we grew up together. So he remembers playing in the woods with me when we were kids. Um, but... Uh, my mother, um, they, she was like this really political activist in our small town. Mm. Like she was always arguing with the police. Uh, turns mm. out years later, you know, she'd been, uh, you know, there's a lot of drugs and whatnot in the small towns. Uh, but my mother was very anti-police, anti-establishment, anti-government. And I recall like in the summer times in Crystal, down by the lakes, her picketing with a few of her friends out there picketing with signs against the local police and local government and local judges and, and prosecutors. And that put a sour taste in their mouth for my family. So I personally believe that the reason they didn't let us off as just young boys and took us home, let us get our spankings and groundings, they, they took us home, but they arrested us and charged us with felonies. And I think that they did that to get back at my mother. Who to get back at your mother, because they always let children off and say no. Right, right. And I'm quite sure that that was the reason why we didn't get off on that case, because there was a lot of kids in my area that were getting into trouble doing things. And that's the treatment they got. Go home. You, know, you tell your parents, oh, you know, bad kid, you're freaking seven. You don't charge a seven-year-old with a felony for breaking into a church. What did that do to you? actually knowing now did they say just keep your nose clean young man and this will disappear for sure. for sure like the 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 cops that arrested us i distinctly recall i think his name was musgraves or muscott one of the two which is one of the cops that my mother hated um okay. but i recall him sitting us in the back seat of the cop car and telling us this is not what you do little boys don't do this well i remember him just lecturing the hell out of me and then taking us back and dropping us off with our mother and I think that for the first time in my life, this is a man that was, well, he looked upset with me and he was disciplining me and he was mm -hmm. telling me, this isn't a little, you know, he was giving you that, that almost like that fatherly discipline. Right. Where you feel you've let someone down. Right. So when he dropped us off, I, I, clearly I got my ass whooped by my mother, uh, you know, and, and things went south, but I missed it when he was gone. You know what I mean? After he was oh, yeah. gone, I'm like, because now I'm going back to her boyfriend who's just, you know, diddling me. And and that's not that's not a disciplinarian. That's not somebody I want around because I know what's happening to me 
when nobody else is there with this man is wrong. Uh, and this isn't what I want. Uh, so I started to miss that. I'm like, man, how do I talk to that guy, that, that cop again? How do, I, mm -hmm. how do I talk to that cop? And I, I went out and I stole a bike. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I went out, stole the bike, destroyed it. it. Was it was weird? Do you remember those those tricycles? They were like three wheel tricycles with the bike with the basket in the back. They were yeah. for adults. Yeah, one of those. I stole it. I crashed it into a creek and and destroyed it. Uh, and then the, like I wasn't even slick about it. <laughs> so the lady knew it. She called the police, and here comes the cop again. Whoa, this is the second time. Boy, you're just a bad cat, aren't you? Let me tell you, blah 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 blah. And we went through a whole lot of that. Uh, and again, there was that feeling again, like, oh, man, <laughs> this guy actually cares about me and wants what's best for me and doesn't want to hurt me. I like this guy. And the same thing with the judge. When I go in, when I went in for the hearing for the church, you know, the judge was disciplining me, disciplining me. The lawyer was disciplining me. The prosecutor was disciplining me. And I, I enjoyed it. <clears throat> I enjoyed it. Love you, so, mom. So did you start, when did you start feeling like this is who I am? Um, by the time you were 16, that's when the first prison sentence came. Uh, how many felonies had you chalked up by then? I, I, I think I had nine or 11. I, I, it was either nine or 11 felonies when I, well, I had nine or 11 when I caught that charge because when I went to prison, I ended up having 15. So it was 11 because I caught four charges at one that time they sent me to, that they sent me to prison for. Now, do you ever ask yourself or talk to people today post incarceration? Um, and I know you're an advocate for a number of different causes, but let's let's something is, is clearly wrong with the way this was handled. Why do you think that no one was brought in to try to save you? Um, you know, like counseling or I mean, why would anyone how can it feel? It seems to me just like you were let down by the adults around you with this these charges at the age of eight or seven. Same thing with the man being in your house doing what he wanted to do. Um, and the adults, again, have let you down. I know that. A lot of us know that feeling. Uh, but, I, I mean, what do you say when you talk about this as far as who you feel is responsible for those early years and what happened with you? Who? Well, at the end of the day, ultimately, the responsibility would have fallen to my mother as the sole parent. Um, she was never really an advocate with like my lawyers. Like she never went in with the attorney and said, hey, fight for my child. So I distinctly recall now knowing the legal system, the way that I know it and the way that that things take place. Mm -hmm. um, she never fought with my lawyers to say, hey, this is a child, you know, th that's making bad. So she didn't try to save you. Right. Clearly something's wrong with this child. And or he's going through something or he's experiencing something and we need to get to the root cause of it and find out why this child continues to commit crimes. Because even at eight, nine, 10 years old, you're still not a criminal. You're a, right. child. You're you're a child. child. You don't possess criminal capacity. So clearly you're doing something for attention or for some other reason. And so that was never there. But when I was 10 is when I actually came out about being molested by all these men. And she took that harshly. You know, she took that that really harshly and she called the police on on all of them. And, oh. you know, she, she was a, very adamant about that um, and did her job as a parent in that department. Um, but I think that I don't I think that she just gave up, to be honest. I don't know her and I have never had that discussion. We've never talked about it. Really? Uh, but I, I think in my opinion, I think she just gave up trying or she didn't know what to do. As a mother, I think she was lost or confused and like, I don't know what to do. My son is being molested by men. He's committing crimes. I don't know what to do. So I think that she just kind of, uh, you know, maybe masked the pain with alcohol and drugs uh, and, and didn't know what to do. Well, I'm sure that played a part because um, the numbing effect makes things, every, everything else, you know, puts a buffer between the reality and the reality. For so sure. let me ask you this. Did you feel like, uh, well, did the did the abuse start before the first crime? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It started at five. At the so, age five. so you were doing what any kid would do. You were acting out. You were, you were actually asking for help. For sure. For help. Definitely a cry for help, for sure. So do you ever, who do you blame when you, or do you, have you found a way around that? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't put the blame on anyone in particular. Could there have been somebody that could have stepped in and done something better? Sure, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, I made the decisions. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, even being molested a lot forces you to grow up a lot. Tell me about it. And by the time I'm ten years old or eleven years old, uh, I'm already more mature than most 10 or 11 year olds or 15 year olds for that right. matter because you've experienced adult life right. i relate to that so you, go ahead oh uh, in that in that regard I, I i blame myself at 10 years old i have to blame myself because i knew mentally what was going on i knew this is wrong but i'm going to do it anyway but no no one was doing it's i find it interesting that your mother was a protester an advocate for causes, but, and those were all outside of the family dynamic, but then she was letting everything fall apart inside. Can you, can you speak to why you, why do you, why do you feel you and she have never had that conversation even now? Uh, well, my mother, well, she's older uh, at this point in the game. And you are too. And she, I mean, she doesn't have any family. She lives in Arizona by herself. And, and to me, it's, I, I've moved past it because I'm so happy with where I'm at in my life right now. Mm -hmm. that there's no point in me drudging it up for her and making her feel like shit. Cause that's what that's going to do. At the end of the day, it's going to shine. It's going to hold a mirror up to the parent that you were and the person that you were. And what's the point? Well, that what about closure and healing? I mean, what about, look at where you are today. Look Maybe. at where you are today. I mean, yeah, all that shit happened, but I'm just speaking from my own experience. I also know that when those things happen, especially when we're the innocent, the child, we didn't, you know, I didn't crawl out of my bassinet and tell them, you know, I'm out of here, forward my pampers to this address. I, It was a decision made uh, for me. And it put me in a position where those all these other things, just like you with the abuse and whatnot happened to me. So let me ask you though, uh, do you believe, because, you know, not the same scenario, but but still, as far as having to have that conversation with my birth mother, found her after 32 years, and thank God we had a wonderful relationship all the way to the very last breath. But I didn't realize until we had those conversations where I asked questions and they were answered or not, because there were some she refused to even go there about my father and stuff because I was a product of rape. Um, and so... You know, and I respected those boundaries, but how do you feel about closure? Because there was an incident when we were on a show together a couple of years ago where you were talking about your experience with your brother. And I'm assuming it's the one that you were arrested with the first time and you guys hadn't spoken. Talk about that, if you will, um, because he was on the show trolling, <laughs> watching that day when you outed. Uh, something. Go ahead and talk about that. And how, what about that relationship? Has that changed at all since that day? Tell everybody, set that up. Tell everybody about what happened uh, that day. So my brother and I were as close as possible growing up. We're all we, we were all we had, you know, mm -hmm. we were, uh, we were 19 months apart. He's the, he's the elder. Uh, he was taken, like twins. Yeah. He was taken away when I was 12 and he was 13. Uh, the judge put him in a detention center uh, and we were, we had not seen each other or been together until I was 21 when I got released from prison. So we, we missed that whole gap in life. Okay. And, um, you know, I would have given my breath for my brother. Like he was the one family member or human being on this earth that I cherished. Like I worshiped him. He was my older brother. And when I got out of prison and we were able to reunite and get back together, he's now 22 or 23 and I'm 21. And it's like, I love this guy. I love this man. This is my brother. Like I was so defensive of him. Like you couldn't even look at him wrong or I would, I would hit you. I would attack you physically. If I thought you had a problem with my brother, like this is how much I love this guy. Uh, and we, you know, we went all over the world or all over the country together, did a lot of traveling, spent a lot of time together. Uh, and I met a girl through him. He used to date a girl named Chelsea. And I met uh, her little sister named Nikki, who was at his house when I got out of prison. And he introduced me to her as his little sister, just my little sister, Nikki. Uh, 
and Nikki and I, we were attracted to each other immediately, hit it off really good. Um, and we started engaging in a relationship and she got pregnant very soon. Uh, and so that she is my oldest son's mother, Caden. And when we caught this next case, um, I, I don't What you talking about, Willis? Statue of limitations is kicked in anyway. We oh. did we did our crimes together on this, but I took the oh, charge. So you're talking about when y'all didn't get caught for. Right. Okay. I took, I took the charges. Okay. Um, and when we went, when we got arrested, I told them it's all me. It wasn't him. It, he didn't do it. So I protected him because I didn't want him to go to prison for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, he couldn't handle it. While you're my older brother and you've always been tougher, blah, blah, blah. I've walked the path of prison. I've been through it. I can handle it. Mm -hmm. You can't. You can't go do a significant stretch of time. Uh, so I took all the charges. I did it. I did everything. I did everything. Uh, and he still had to go for like a year and a half because he had a gun. Uh, so he got to do a little cakewalk bit, you know, on an easy level, uh, an easy bit to get through. And even while that they were, they held his parole because there were still more charges and they took me into court and they held his parole until I testified and I testified, I did everything. He did nothing. They gave him his parole. So he was he was getting out. And he sent me a letter and he was like, bro, thank you for that, blah, blah, blah. I don't have anywhere to go. I don't know what to do. So I called Nikki and said, hey, Frank's getting out. He needs a place to go. You might as well let him come stay with you. He's like a brother to you anyway. Uh, he can help you with Caden, blah, blah, uh -oh. blah. And I know where this is going. He did. Uh, and it wasn't, he got out in, I think, August of 2008. Or, or no, August of 2006, August of 2006. And by October, she was pregnant. So you have a nephew and a son who are cousins. And brothers. And brothers. Because out of all the women in the world, you chose my son's mother to sleep with. Out of all the dudes in the world, you chose my brother to sleep with. And now, you, sure, you sure you don't come from hill people? Uh, they, come from people. Just, they come from real people. I don't even know. Uh, if I'm, I don't even know if I'm related to these people. I'm pretty sure I was adopted, man. So like, what about your relationship with your son, Caden? Uh, it's it's rocky at this point, man. It's it's yeah. It was. It, Who does he see as his dad? He well, he calls my brother dad. He's called him dad his whole life. And what does that and do? What on the outside, do? if my brother wasn't my blood brother, I would respect it because he's raised my son. Uh, in a wonderful home. They, you know, they have a good family. They're both workers. They have a great yeah. family on the surface. It's a great family. He, you know, and he's been there his whole life. The problem it just wasn't your kid. It's your nephew, not your son. <laughs> right, right. And, and to me, that's like the ultimate level of betrayal. That's what, you know, that's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Like you can betray anybody you want to bro, but you don't betray your blood brother. Like I so, work with you, man. <laughs> so can you find it? Do you think you'll ever, uh, let, let's talk about this forgiveness component because, um, it seems to be a missing piece in, uh, some really close family relationships. Let's talk about that. Cause you have your own son now, little yeah. Roman looks just like you. So when you're looking at what are you going to do when he starts asking you questions about grandma, um, about my uncle, and things like that. Have you gone through that? Have you rehearsed what you're, how you're going to deal with that? Uh, it, yeah, it's it's just blunt honesty. I won't hide it. I don't hide anything for anybody. I don't sugarcoat anything for anybody, and I I won't. I refuse to do that. Like with Caden, Caden and I have had that talk when he asked me. He he knows that Frank is not his father. He knows that I'm his father. Uh, he knows that Frank is his uncle, and he knows that his brother is his cousin. Um, but not being there because he lives in Michigan and, you know, he's a child at the end of the day, he's 17 now, but he's, he's a child still, you know what I mean? Like you still don't quite cut. He's a mama's boy. At the end of the day, she raised him up, you know, pampered his ass the whole way. Uh, so he won't even, he doesn't have the, the self-awareness to actually stand up and speak for himself against his mother to say that was wrong that you did that to my father. That's wrong that you, you know, that these things have transpired in my life. Uh, and so right now he's probably mad at me uh, because I'm the dad that wasn't there. 
you know, I, I, I'm, and in a kid's mind, maybe he blames me for not being there, which he's absolutely right. I'm the one that went to prison. That's my fault. Mm -hmm. you know, he didn't do that. Frank didn't do that. I did that. So he has the right to be angry at me with that. And when he's ready, when he's adult enough, we can have that discussion as well. I still send him messages. I still, you know, hit him up and let him know that I love him, that I'm always going to be there mm -hmm. for him. He just, you know, he's going through that phase. He's 17 right now. He probably really hates the world. Right. Uh, let me ask, let me ask, let me ask this. Um, and then we're going to go to break and come back and hit uh, some of the things that you're doing today and talk about how you've uh, extracted what you've needed from all of these experiences, also known as traumas, um, to build the world that you live within today. But before we go to break, I want to ask you, um, when you are fathering, when you're parenting Roman, do you, is it like you have one foot in the past to remember the things that you want to make sure you save him from? You know, a lot of the times we, you know, that fight or flight, we, we leave the proverbial scene of the crime, that trauma entry point. And the last thing we want to do is even look in the rearview mirror and acknowledge that it happened because we want to be as far um, as away, away from it as possible. Now, but when you're parenting a son, when you, even the protection from, uh, predators and whatnot. Um, you have to have something in place where, you know, stranger danger, if there's something you need to talk about, I'm here, especially with boys. If something happens to a boy by a man, it's, I know I couldn't talk to my mom. I, I didn't, I, there was no way, there was no way. Um, and there was no father in our home, you know? Um, so what about that? Um, how do you, what goes through your mind when you're looking at your son and you have that thing that parents have where, well, most parents, obviously, clearly not all do, but that different thing that makes you vested in keeping him safe all day, every day for the rest of your life. Um, how do you deal stepping back and forth and both when you still have open doors, you know, there's no closure on that other side, your brother, your mother, but then you have this open door to build this future with your son Roman, how, how do, is, is it tough or what have you done? I mean, it's not to me, though. I legitimately look back at my whole life and apply the exact opposite. <laughs> mm. so whenever a situation comes up, I'm like, OK, what was happening in my life at this age or what was going on here? Right. And do the exact opposite, because just about everything in my life up until, <laughs> you know, 13, right. 13 was absolute crap. So that's what I do. Okay. Awesome. You guys, when we return, we're <laughs> going to speak further with Sonny Von Cleveland. Um, and we're going to get into some of the things, how he got started in the world of broadcasting and influencing, uh, what made him feel that a guy filled covered with tattoos with a record, as long as your arm, uh, would be able to be taken seriously in uh, the world of influence. And so when we come back, we're gonna ask how he got started and you can share some of the things that you've put in place that have helped you walk up that staircase to the world you live in today. We'll be back in just a moment. You guys don't go away. when they're trying to really get focused and productive to ignore the hey bros because they're low priority. Put your motivation, create your checklist, and then that's the formula, man.
All right, we're back. Welcome back to today's installment of Bathroom Moments. I'm your host, Lauren Michaels Harris, with my guest today, uh, Sunny Bank Cleveland. I want to say thank you before I bring you back in to both of my sponsors for today. Design Your Paycheck with Robert, Rob, Dr. Robert Garcia, who is actually my business coach and uh, can't tell you how good he is. He has helped me in, uh, I think it was in the first two weeks of working with Dr. Rob, I cleared around $17,000 worth of um, income. So um, I highly recommend it if you're looking for a business coach. And also thank you to Jillian Sandoval and the Unleash Your Inner Goddess uh, um, program. So Sunny Bond Cleveland, uh, here we are. We're back. Thank you for being here today. Before we went to break, we were talking about some of your backstory. And I'd like to now, let's finish it out today if we could, about where you are today and how you've taken all of that dusty road known as your past and paved, if you will, a super highway, which you're you're just flying down. It's like the Autobahn. I watch you. Um, well, actually we work together. You coach with me. And uh, so I have an up close personal uh, perspective with you. It's like, uh, I've watched you like this, you know, hello, Gamshu, uh, you know, uh, for a number of years now, and I can't tell you how proud I am um, um, from what you've done and what I've learned from watching you do what you do. So tell everybody all the things you have on the stove of purpose cooking right now. What's, what's cooking in the sunny vine? Cleveland well, kitchen? the way that this all happened, and I mean, you've been an incremental part in this, uh, of for sure. Um, mm. there was, there, there came a point where I realized when a man has absolutely nothing, you have nothing to lose. Mm. So, what, what what do I have to lose by putting myself out there and going for everything that they said I would never be or I could right. never have? Right. And I just, with unrestrained belief in myself, I don't care if nobody else believes in it because I use the fuel of those who doubt me to motivate me to do it even more. And, and that's it. So I hit the ground running. I know that there are millions and millions of people that have gone through the same thing I have, if not worse. They've gone, they've, there's so many stories that are way worse than mine, but there's also similar and there's some that are not as bad and nobody talks about it. Not a lot of people talk about it. And so for me to put it on display, it may reach that one person who's going through it or has experienced it and has no idea how to get through it. And they look for somebody They're They're scouring through the internet, wondering how, how does somebody deal with these things? How does somebody get through this? And when you put yourself on display, authenticity has such an attractive quality to it, being authentically who you are. But And that starts with self-awareness, knowing who you are, knowing what you've been through, and just putting yourself out there authentically. It, it, it reaches people. It connects with people. And knowing that, uh, when I jumped in with you a couple of years ago, you started to guide me down the path of, of motivational speaking about how to... How to have a focused point when you speak about reaching people and hitting those certain topics uh, that that are attractive to people that bring them in. And so I started to employ that in my life and I started to see, I mean, I had a great job uh, after you and I had started working together. You know, the, the motivational thing to me was a slow growing process because I still had to work. I still had to pay bills and still had to put some, uh, uh, you know, food on the table. And, and then COVID came along and destroyed that. And I thought to myself, what would Lauren do if Lauren was in this position? And it was- What the hell? It's, I decided that I have to go even harder. If it's something you're passionate about and something you believe in, you put everything you have into it. Unrestrained belief, unbridled passion, and you, you go for it. Somebody's going to hear that message somewhere. And so I did, I, I started, uh, I jumped on YouTube because I seen there's a great reactor named No Life Shack, uh, who's been the inspiration for me to get started in that realm. I saw him doing it and I thought to myself, man, that just looks fun. The guy just reacts to music all day, uh, you know, several times a day, whatever. And he's built a career out of it. So I said, well, if he can do it, so can I. So can I. We're all human beings. We are all built the same and we all have that same opportunity. Uh, the beautiful thing about YouTube is that it's all of, it, it's there for you to use it if you want to use it. Nobody can tell you you can't. Nobody can stop you. Nobody can tell you what you can't do. And I didn't know the first thing about it. I literally jumped on using the camera that was on my computer screen and the microphone that was built into my computer and said, I'm going to watch a video. 
Check it out with me, guys. Mm -hmm. I started to do that. Uh, and I'm so passionate about music. And I think I think that passion resonates with people when they see it because they feel the same way. Uh, so people started tuning in. And then it started attracting more. I started noticing that the views are going up and that people are subscribing. And then they're, the people are so amazing because they guide you along. They say, hey, man, check out this video. Check out this video. Check out this video. And you just listen to them and you pay attention to the people that support you and, and you show them love back. And so I started watching the videos they told me to. And then, you know, I stumbled upon uh, some great bands like Nightwish and Band Made and Baby Metal and I started seeing their videos and they have huge fan bases and those people started seeing that authenticity and they start watching. And then I noticed, okay, I have a platform. The first thing I'm going to do if I have a platform is talk about my trauma, what I've been through, because I am passionate about motivating other people and helping people. So that as soon as I got more than 50 people seeing something from me, I immediately went to it. Listen, this is what I've been through in life. If you've been through it, listen, because I'm going to help you get through it. And it started to resonate with other people. And, and that's the part that a lot of people, I believe, overlook when considering whether that I can find the courage or if I have already within me the courage to bear my scars. For sure. World, because what we don't understand in most cases is that, you know, I know I was shamed into covering mine up for decades. And the very first night that I, I exposed those scars and told told my story, like you're saying you did, it turned into the gold cast video, 22 million views. Who did I'd have never been able to figure that out. Um, but I believe that when we share our scars, the first thing they do for us and for others is that it's immediate proof. Oh, look at the scar. It's immediate proof that something that was an open wound at one point has now scabbed over and healed. Exactly. It is immediate proof of healing. And once you stop hiding them, covering them up, buttoning them up, you start exposing them to the world. People say, well, what's that right underneath it? Because that's what happened. When I was like, what? What are you talking about? And then I look, oh no, I didn't notice that. So, you know, when you're when you're trying to walk, when you have agreed that you want to do something with everything you've lived, you know, the universe gives you like this. And now I can look, oh, there's a heart right underneath that scar. And it's the heart of a story, but it's waiting for me. It's waiting for us to give it permission to be. And that's what you've done. So you have how many different uh, uh, shows and things that you have going on right now? I know you got a few. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I've uh, I have whittled some of them down and stopped uh, a couple. What's, what's out there now? The right now, currently, we're running season two of the Morning Brew, which you can find on Delight's Digital Cafe. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll actually grab up that link for you if you want, and you can drop it. They actually have the sh they have a show going on right now with an. Incredible I was gonna say you got a lot of followers here today. I'm sure one of them has that link. Just drop it in the comments. With an incredible guest, I'm actually gonna drop it right now. Uh, so Great. it's right there. There's the link. Uh, so we have the morning brew that's going on. Uh, and we have some of the people that are here right now are regulars on the morning brew. Uh, it's an incredible show. Welcome everybody. Uh, I absolutely enjoy that show. We reach people around the world and I uh, have a different guest every day. I have a couple co-hosts on there. Um, I ran a season of holding the rope, which was a wonderfully successful show. Uh, there was, we helped a lot of people, met a lot of interesting people and made a lot of good networking connections there. Um, and then I do, I have a daily live show on YouTube that I do every day, Monday through Friday, noon till about two o'clock where we literally wow. just sit down and share the love of music together. It's like a daily music show. Okay. We, we just come together. Uh, the people that support are so incredible. They come in, they they drop donations uh, to get the song that they want to see for the on that day for the show, uh, and and we we enjoy each other's company around the world. We enjoy the beauty of music and rock out together. And what's the name uh, of that one? Uh, Daily Rock Live. Daily Rock Live on YouTube. It's a playlist. Uh, I don't know if it's actually a playlist on my YouTube. Actually, now that I think about it, but we just started that back. <laughs> couple weeks ago uh and it's really good other than that uh that's pretty much all i have going on i do do a show uh with my other company called savage mmg uh it's a a bit of a a more edgy and adult uh podcast called just bs uh with me and uh, a good friend of mine named bob 
Uh, and we just go in there and we have fun and talk about more adult oriented topics, not porn. No, but, I know what you mean. Right. Like adult topics in the world <clears throat> and primarily yeah. make fun of it uh, because you got to laugh. You can't take life too seriously, man. You have to smile and you have to laugh. And, and I think that's the the best path to healing anything is well, smiling. It is. Now, yeah. speaking of healing, speaking of healing, talk about if you could. We got about eight minutes left. What happens? Because I know it's happened because it's happened to me. What happens when you run into that person or those people that knew the old version? When you were out there, when we were out there living in all that craziness, um, in and out of prison and either on parole or on the way back in, uh, like the tread, like it was like the hamster wheel. Yeah. Now they see you totally different. They hear what you say and you can tell because I know it. Like I said, it's happened to me. You can, see it. <laughs> you can see it on their faces right at first when they first meet you before they get to come in and actually see you doing your thing. You can see it on their face like, is this really possible? Could he have really done this? And I don't know about you, but when I mean, I have some friends that were inside with me and uh, they're out now and a few of them are lifers, you know, and I predicted because uh, I would always talk to a lot of lifers because I was like, if anybody can teach me how to appreciate the life I still have in front of me, it'll be someone who has had their life taken from them. Mallory, that's, Bang. Right. That's the same thing that happened to you. So I figured that's why I'm here when I was in there. And that's what I stuck to was my story. And I stuck to it. And today, some of them are out. And when we get back and we talk and they remind me of Lauren, don't you remember when you said that I had one guy, Clay, call me a year ago and said, you know what? You told me when I was going to get out the month and stuff. And that was seven years before it was even possible. Two years after that, it happened. And you were one year in one day off on your prediction. I wrote that date down that and just he goes but you gave me hope that it could happen and that it would happen and i never doubted lauren that you would go home and do what you said you were going to do and i think about how many millions of times i doubted it myself and so do you ever have have you ever had that experience where people get to see both sides of you what did they what so what did they say and how does it make you feel when they say it? I think uh, Rocky Johnson dropped some stuff about it earlier and in, in, in right here in the chat. Yep, I saw that. I can pull that Johnson, up. Uh, did a, a nice little stretch of time with me. Um, I keep a lot of those those men, the ones that I knew that had potential, the ones that I know that have yes. figured things out. Uh, I told them this is what I was going to do before we got out, and now they get to see it right mm -hmm. here. Yes, Rocky Johnson. Uh, and, and that's – I, I try to be a friend and a brother and a motivator to these men. Uh, I tried to help them when I was there and I told them this is what we're going to do. And I'm going to show you by example, I'm going to be a living example that this is possible. And so I try to motivate them and show them through my actions that you can achieve whatever you want, regardless of what the past has done to us. And, and, th and this, these guys are living proof for me. They, they, this is, these are the rewards that I take from it. You know, these are the rewards I I take from the past that I've had. And my mom, my ma here, uh, she's not my birth mother, but my adopted ma, Jill Setzer. She's right here. Uh, she was in prison with me as well. This is where I met her. She worked in the food service industry in prison. And she, I told her I was doing the same thing. And she's followed me ever since and has been just such an amazing person in my life. She's become my ma. Like, she's my adopted mother. She's, I love her to death. Uh, but I told her this is what I was going to do. And one of my shining moments that she even asked a little bit ago that I talk about was that defining moment for me when I realized like I did it. I wore a $2,000 suit into the prison and went back into prison and yeah. gave a speech to 50 inmates and told them I've been there. I know I smell the Keefe coffee in your cups. Okay. I feel the prison blues that you're wearing. I know the cheap ass drawers that you've got on right now. I know those I've, 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 I've eaten that cook up. <laughs> right, right. I, I, right. I've been there. This is what you can accomplish. This is what you can do because this is temporary. Believe in yourself and know who you are. Have self-awareness, mm -hmm. my guy. That's what's going to get you through this. That's what's going to get you up. And just, I, I pride myself on, on walking what I talk. I, I, which is why I've gone through the things that we've gone through in the last few months. I put everything I go through on display. The breakup with Jen that, it, that just happened, I mm -hmm. put it on display. I lost everything and was homeless a month and a half ago. 
I know. Everything. And I. But what did you learn? But what did you learn? Because you didn't, let me tell you, all that is around you. Talk about that. That's how I want you to take us out of here with, because, uh, you know, what did you learn from that? When what when someone thought they were taking everything from you and here you sit where it may not be exactly the same, but you have what you need, not necessarily what you feel you want, but what you need. What did you learn from that most recent experience with your breakup? Uh, well, the as number of people be in there for you, because I watched it happen on social media because you like you said, you put it out there. The number one thing that I learned from that experience was that no matter what happens, you can get up and you can keep moving forward no matter what, if, when no matter how dark it looks. I literally was standing outside December 12th in my pants and a sweatshirt and that's it. And then a month later, here we are. We're right. back up. We're running. I got my own home, my new car, a new place. Because it, nothing can stop you. Believe in yourself. Know your goal. Define and outline what it is you want out of life. But here's where I'm trying to get you there because I know because it happened with me. When we were not doing the right things or doing the best with what we had, even with what we'd gone through that wasn't our fault, we still found ourselves in situations that we created like the one – that looked like the one you just came through, but there was nobody there to lend a hand because we created it. And when we created that, we didn't write in the characters. We didn't have those kind of people sitting in the front row seats. Today, you have better people sitting in the front row seats of your life because well, the minute you were in that position and someone, it says no weapon formed against us. It doesn't say weapons that we create and hand to people and say, here, kill right. me with this. Right. Why don't you try this on me? Cut my head off with right. this. And then you found that there were people there for you, right? So I want you to say one, tell one thing. This is your Jerry Springer thought. Tell us today. Now, I, and I mean, because before the breakup and all this, it, you looked at it one way. You thought it was going to always be one way. And then there was a breakup. And the number one thing that was threatened is right there on the screen. 100%. Okay. So tell us how important it is to know what matters most to you after you take a breath. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the most important thing on the planet. It's... You 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 think that you know everything that's going to happen. You think, you try to calculate, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and this is the fallout that I'm going to prepare for. And then you get hit with every possible curveball in the game. Everything that you didn't think would happen, happens. The people that you didn't think were going to support you do support you. The people that you thought would support you don't support you. And all you're left with is passion. All you're left with is what you hold most dear in your life. And I put this little boy at the center of my life. Mm -hmm. And and it has motivated me to, to be that because that's the first thing I thought about when I'm homeless. I lost everything. My son is going to think I'm a failure and I'm not going to be there for him. Mm. I can't let that happen. There you go. And I just put him at the center of it. And it motivated me and pushed me and compelled me that I have to do better for him because nobody did that for me. No, man, no man, no dad, no brother thought that I was worthy enough to give their everything for. This little boy will never know that feeling. There you go. There's the blessing that came in through that. That was the blessing that came through the doggy door in the trauma door all those years back when you were just an eight-year-old boy yourself. So listen, here is where you can go, one of the places, if you'd like to continue this dialogue with Sonny Von Cleveland, find out where he's at, what he's doing, what time the show's there, head over to Sonny, SonnyVonCleveland.com, or you can also find him here on YouTube, where you can watch all of his content. You can binge watch, do whatever you need at Sonny Von Cleveland on YouTube. So, Sonny, I want to thank you so much for coming in today, thank taking you. time. I know you got to run over to your other show and uh, uh, come back and let us know uh, what's going on uh, soon, you know, well, at least know. one more time this year. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I'm so proud of you. I'll see you on a session. I'll see Absolutely. you on Friday. It's because of you. It's because of us. It's because of them. With each other standing beside each other, we can make this world a much better place. You guys, every day that we're with each other, it is our opportunity to share in what I call a modern day stone soup experience. Doesn't matter what you have or don't have, just bring what you can. And it will always be enough if you have the right people sitting in their front row seats 
of your life. I'm Lauren Michaels Harris. Thank you for joining me for today's installment of Bathroom Moments. Join me tomorrow morning, God willing, at 8 a.m. Central, where my guest will be NLP coach, mastermind breakthrough coach, Dan Mendelo. Um, good friend of mine, been in my world for about six or seven years, and I'm so excited to have him here as I am you. Thank you all. Get out in the world today and be the blessing you'd like to receive. Be the gift to the world that you'd like the world to give you in return. Uh, thank you, Sonny. God bless you. Get over to your show. Uh, we'll see you next time. And, all right. Uh, okay. Get out there, you guys, today and be the very best you can be. I'll see Love you Love you guys. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Stop.